In all of the vast reaches of the universe, our planet is the only one that we know contains varied and abundant life. The story of life on Earth is complex, dramatic, and largely a mystery. Over the ages of our existence, we humans have sought, invented, and discovered answers to the ultimate question, why are we here? Scientists are using clues left behind by our ancestors, human and otherwise, to discover our collective past. These clues paint an intricate picture of survival, change, and adaptation, which over time is known as evolution. By investigating evidence of long-vanished life forms, we may not only begin to understand our origins, but perhaps our future as well. Our first step in our journey begins with world-renowned archaeologist Richard Rickard, who will recount our geological history. Evidence of evolution comes from paleontology. The study of fossil remains and other clues to Earth's history. The discovery of many fossils in the 1800s led Charles Darwin to create his theory of evolution. As a result, many theories have surfaced clues about our Earth's history and our evolution. In order to simplify the roughly 4.6 billion years that our Earth has been in existence, the scientists have created the geologic time scale. This scale divides Earth's history and according to major biological events such as mass extinctions. It is then separated into er several eras, which are then divided into periods and are then divided into even smaller epochs. Now we're going to get into the geologic time scale. This starts off with the Cenozoic era, which is divided into the Quaternary period, which marks the arrival of human civilization and mammals, which then goes to the Tertiary period, which marks the diversification of life, such as the arrival of birds, whales, elephants, horses, and different flowering plants, as well as primates. Next is the Meso Mesozoic. This is divided into three periods. First comes the Cretaceous period, where we have the arrival of blackbird dinosaurs as well as flowering plants, then the Jurassic period, which marks the arrival of the first birds and mammals, then the Triassic period, which marks the arrival of the very first dinosaurs, the ancestors to the dinosaurs mentioned in the Cretaceous period. Next in our list of eras comes the Paleozoic era. This marks this is divided into the most periods. First we have the Permian period, which marks the arrival of the first conifers. Then we have the Carboniferous period, where we see an arrival of reptiles. Next comes the Devonian period. In this period, we see an arrival of bony fishes, corals, and primates. That then leads us into, into the Silurian period. Here, we see an arrival of vascular plants, as well as the first fishes of the jaws. And to conclude the Paleozoic era, we have the Order of Vichy. Ordovician era, where we have algae, invertebrates, crapolites, jawless fishes, and the first land plants. Then comes the Cambrian period, where we see an explosion of sponges, worms, and jellyfishes. And before that, there is the Precambrian era, where the first organisms were beginning to form, which overall takes us back to at least another 4.6 billion years. Scientists are able to create this timeline by using fossils, the chemically altered and preserved remains of dead organisms. By examining these objects and studying their origins, we can piece together what sort of world these creatures knew, when they lived, and when they died. Our investigation takes us to Cambridge, where we visit the esteemed paleontologists Diego Vasquez and Rebecca Vanzo in order to understand the fossil record. Fossils, like many things on this planet, come in all shapes and sizes, and it is because of fossils that we are able to document our planet's past at least that of our ancestors and other extinct life forms. Researchers can also use fossils to make accurate predictions regarding evolution. There are three ways that fossils are formed. The first is compression, which takes place when remains are covered in compressed in sediment and preserved. The second is petrification, which involves minerals replacing organic matter and essentially turning a specimen to stone. The third is impressions, or a cast, left when a dead animal's body makes an impression in mud or sediment and then decays. The mud and the imprint hardens into rock. Unfortunately, our fossil record is incomplete, which makes it very hard to figure out key features of evolution. This is due partly to scavengers, who eat dead animals and displace bones, and also to the fact that soft-bodied organisms do not preserve well. So from this diagram, we can uh, see a couple of examples of compression, petrification, and impression. So compression, pretty much say a leaf sinks in, 
fine sediment covers it and then the sediment compresses that forming it into a sedimentary rock. Now petrification is when an animal dies or decays and then is buried. As you can see this little animal right here was buried and eventually that gets uh, the organic material gets replaced and that's how we get um, some things like turn into stone. For example, petrified um, wood would be a great example of that. And then lastly is an impression. An impression is anything that um, when an animal dies and then it gets impressed in the mud, the animal decays away and then the mud hardens, leaving that imprint of the animal, which then turns eventually into a fossil. The age of a fossil can be determined in two ways with modern science relative dating and absolute dating. Relative dating does not give an exact numerical age of the fossil, but rather how old it is in comparison to the rocks and fossils found in the same area. We base relative dating on the law of superposition. The natural law of superposition is based on the idea that old material is deeper in the ground and new material builds on top of it. In this diagram, which is a cross-section of the Earth's crust, layer B is on top of layer A, layer C has formed on top of layer B. From that, we can determine that layer A is the oldest of the three, layer C is the youngest. So, if a fossil was found in layer A, and another fossil was found in layer B, we can determine that layer A fossil is older than layer B's because it was found in a rock layer deeper underground. Absolute dating, on the other hand, gives an actual date in years, not when it occurred as in how we give normal historical dates, for example, it formed in such and such a year, but rather how old it is in relation to the present. For example, we'll say a fossil is 5 million years old, or MYO for short. We determine absolute dating by using radioactive isotopes of certain elements to determine how old the uh, fossil is. To do that, we need to know the half-life of the radioactive isotope. In this example, radioactive isotope A has 40 atoms of its original element and a half-life of one hour. What that means is after one hour, half of the atoms of the isotope will have decayed into a product, leaving 20 atoms of the original element left. In the second hour, half of those will decay to leave only 10 atoms of the original element. In the third hour, the half of that will decay, and so on. So when we find traces of an isotope on a fossil and its corresponding decayed product, when, and we know the half-life, we can work out how many half-lives in total have passed, and therefore how old the fossil is. Now the most common form of radiometric dating that we use, it's a term you've probably heard before, is carbon dating. And it's named that because it specifically uses the isotope carbon-14 to determine the age of the fossil. Now carbon-14 is formed in the atmosphere when cosmic rays bombard nitrogen. And it has a half-life of 5,730 years. Plants take in carbon-14 when they photosynthesize and animals will take it in when they, when they eat the plants. It's the same way organisms uh, take in uh, carbon-12, which is the more common form of carbon. So both forms of carbon will accumulate inside the organism's bodies. When the organisms decease, intake of both forms of carbon will stop. The ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, however, will decrease slowly over time from that point, however, because carbon-14, being radioactive, will decay. Carbon-12, its more stable counterpart, will not. So when we find an organism that has been deceased for a long time, we can measure the amounts of carbon-14 and carbon-12 remaining in its remains, and the ratio of the two carbons will tell us how long ago that organism died. In addition to when our ancestors lived, fossilized remains can tell us where they lived, which is not always the same place that the fossils are found. The Earth has undergone drastic changes over the eons since its inception. The remains of the animals who witnessed these changes are scattered like puzzle pieces across the planet, creating a web of relation and dispersion. 
Scientists must follow each strand of evidence to find out how life and the planet itself have changed over time. One such scientist is Professor Alfredo Rodriguez from our very own University of Virginia. It might seem hard to imagine that Earth's continents have not always been located where they are right now. But a world of evidence, including the distribution of some key fossils, indicate the Earth was the continents were once united, and it was called Pangaea. It was about 280 and 200 million years ago. So I'm going to talk about how biogeography considers a species geographical location. Geographical barriers greatly influence the origin of a species. It is therefore not surprising that geography and biology overlap in one field, biogeography, the study of the distribution of a species across the planet. The theory of plate tectonics explains Earth's shifting continents. Despite the occasional volcanic eruption and earthquakes, Earth's geological history might seem rather uneventful. Not so fossils tell the story of ancient seafloor rising all the way to the Earth's ceiling, the Himalayan mountain. So a question you might ask yourself is, how the fossils of marine animals end up more than 3,600 meters above sea level? The answer is that Earth's continents are in motion, an idea called the continental drift. According to the theory of plate tectonics, Earth's surface consists of several rigid layers that move and respond to forces acting deep within the plate. The case of the missing marsupials. Miss marsupials are poached mammals such as kangaroos, like this one, koalas, and sugar gliders. Nevertheless, fossil evidence suggests that marsupials were diverse and abundant in South America about one or two million years ago, long after the counterparts on most other continents has disappeared. Island, island biogeography. A smaller scale application, biogeography is the study of a species on island chains. Hawaii, the Galapagos, and other island groups house unique group of species that appear closely related to those on the nearest mainland. Wallace Slime Biography considers prominently in the history of evolutionary thought. Alfred Russell Wallace, the British naturalist who independently discovered natural selection, along with Charles Darwin, had noticed that unique assemblage of birds and mammals on either side of imaginary line on Malay Archipelago. From the bones of our ancestors, we have discovered their location and place in time. Once they have been organized on map and timeline, the question we are left with is how do they all come together? How did one species become another? To answer these questions, we must turn away from the dead and look to the living. We are kin to the creatures whose remnants we pry from the earth. Within us are the same secrets guarded by time, and also within us is the ability to discover the truth. In order to uncover these truths, our search leads us to evolutionary biologist Quabina, where he discusses inherited traits. The present traces its bearings to the past. Homologous structures have shared evolutionary origin. Two structures are known as homologous if similarities between them reflect common ancestry. Analogous structures serve the same function but have different embryological origins. The tail of sharks and whales serve the same purpose and are of roughly the same shape. But a shark's tail is vertical and that of a whale is horizontal because they develop from different structures. Homology is a powerful tool for discovering evolutionary relationships. However, evolution is not a perfect process. Vestigial structures are structures or organs that have been claimed by evolutionists to be leftovers that are no longer functional. A theological argument presented in favor of evolution is that God would not have created useless structures and organs.
Humans have several vestigial structures such as the tiny muscles that makes hair stand on end that helped our fairy ancestors conserve hair. Some plants also have vestigial structures. Dandelions and plants like these, for instance, produce cis asexual. Yet their flowers have male and female parts that do not participate in reproduction. Convergent evolution produces superficial similarities. Convergent evolution describes independent evolution of similar features in species of different lineages. This results in analogous structures that have similar form and function but were not present in the last common ancestor. The current evolution flight is a classic example of convergent evolution. Flying insects, bears and bats have evolved the capacity for flight independently. Functionally, similar structures that arise through convergent evolution are termed as analogous. In contrast to homologous structures or trees, which have a common origin but not necessarily have the same function. If different species can share physical traits, then it stands to reason that the development of those traits is a similar process. To find out, scientists must examine current living animals before they're even born. By watching an embryo's development, patterns of formation can be found, as well as a striking physical similarity between various organisms. Evolutionary developmental biologist Robin Pettit illustrates embryonic congruence in a speech given at UVA. Embryonic development patterns can provide clues to a species' evolution. This is because some different organisms have the same parts just in different proportions. In other words, related organisms go through the same developmental processes to produce similar physical features. Biologists came to this conclusion by studying how the adult body takes its shape from its single-celled beginnings. For example, skulls of most animals look much the same at first, but develop in different ways. Another clue provided by embryonic development is the resemblance between embryos of different species. Biologists have discovered that vertebrae embryos look alike in early stages of their development, but the end result is not because they develop at different rates. Homeotic genes are another piece of the puzzle. Homeotic describes any gene that leads to organisms with structures in abnormal places when the gene is mutated, and genes are any region of DNA that encodes a protein. The study of genes that contribute to the development is called evolutionary developmental biology, or EVO-DEVO for short. Evo-Devo biologists share the goal of identifying homeotic genes. Next is gene regulation. Biologists look for new phenotypes which are physical appearances and come from mutations in DNA. In eukaryotic cells, there are proteins called transcription factors which are necessary for gene expression. These proteins bind to DNA enhancers and signal for a gene to turn off. Mutations in those enhancers cause new features to develop, but changes in the enhancers cause the, lo the loss of a trait such as pigment. I'm Robin, and this concludes our presentation. Evolutionary hints can be found on a smaller scale than outward appearance. The family resemblance goes much deeper into our very DNA. The blueprints for our construction are recycled over and again from those who lived before us. By tracing DNA backwards, biologists can uncover strands of connected inheritance to cousin species that on the outside look nothing alike. Inside, they are closer than we could have guessed. To conclude our quest, paleontologist Anthony Nguyen explains evolution on a cellular level. Evidence for evolution can be found in nucleic acids such as DNA or, or RNA. And, and in the subunits of nucleic acid, which would be nucleotides, and the subunits of proteins, which are amino acids. In order to look into the theory of evolution, 
By all, just comparing the nucleotide and amino acid sequence among the species, animals descended from a common ancestor, like the tiger and the snow leopard, will have comparable sequences. Studying these sequences can also reveal the depth and the scope of interrelatedness. Even humans and rats share a shared protein. The, the DNA of living organisms can even be compared to that of extinct species. Although most of the cell's genetic material is in the nucleus, the cell mitochondria contains some DNA. This is called mtDNA or also known as mitochondria DNA. mtDNA is why you use because Every cell has a mitochondria, which means each cell contains MT, mtDNA. And some of the, some of the mtDNA will remain intact in the extinct organism or specimens and can be extracted. Cells do change over time. Over time. However, like a molecular clock, although it may sound as easy as looking at your watch and waiting for the genes to change, it's not. Many variables come into into this process, since different region, regions of chromosomes change at change at different rates. Researchers have to keep in mind how much time has passed between the two species and their common ancestor. Evolution is apparent in every living, dead, and unborn organism on Earth. That beings adapt to shifting environments from one generation to the next is irrefutable as is the fact that diverse species across the planet are related, however distantly. These changes and relationships hint at the cause of a singular and extraordinary event, the dawn of life on Earth. Even when surrounded by evidence, complete knowledge of the origin and transformation of life is an elusive goal. With every discovery, the truth becomes closer. Someday, in the not-so-distant future, by sifting through the remains of an ancient world, as well as the denizens of the current, humans may find the answers to the existence of life. Evidence for evolution, what? <laughs> Finish the sentence, look up yeah, at the camera. Oh, at, at the camera, not the camera. like in thought. Ready, set, go. Like the tiger and the snow leopard, they. Come on, man, what are you doing? Oh, I'll, I'll cut it, just, just yeah, keep going. <clears throat> like the snow tiger and the. God damn it. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> Look at it. Put it close to your face. There you go. Wee. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm just gonna talk about crazy stuff. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> what I saw last night. Go. Just a little bit more. <laughs> the age of a fossil could be determined. Determined. <laughs> it's okay, go. Okay. The age of. Go. I can't do Go. Although. Although. Go. Hello. Oh, go ahead. I'll take my hat off or something. Was it off? I don't know, was it off? It was off over there, right? Yeah. I saw that. We would have been on this whole time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like how it is. You have to act like you're looking at it. Okay. So, as you, so. Okay. As you look at it, then I begin to read. Yeah. yeah. Now throw it and catch it. Keep doing that. That's like you're catching a 
One, two, three, go. I'm Robin, and this concludes our presentation.